let's let's talk about uh, broadcasting, broadcast mixing a little bit, and maybe just some general tips, approaches about how we can um, think about broadcast mixing versus just like the front of house mix, what's coming out of the console. Okay, so there's there's um, you know this is an, uh, again uh, I feel like we are we're we're like rocks skimming on the surface of of a whole bunch of very deep ponds. So I'm definitely going to be skimming on the surface of very deep ponds. But um, the biggest challenge in moving from uh, live sound reinforcement mixing to broadcast mixing is dynamics. Um, and so much of that is comes down to the way that our brains perceive um, a live event versus a, something on a screen. So if I go to a concert and I see a band perform and then I see some, you know, the, the lead singer talk in between songs and then they perform again and then they do a, a quiet song and then they do a loud song and whatever, my brain expects the dynamic range to be the same as if I were just sitting in somebody's garage and a dude was talking to me and then they played a song and then a dude was talking to me and then they played a song. I expect, because it's happening live in front of me, I expect a wide dynamic range. I expect soft songs to be soft. I expect loud songs to be loud. I expect somebody talking to be a lot quieter than drums pounding away. Like there's, you know, and and so, you know, if, you, if you've, um, ever done and and i have you've probably probably done this with smart or other tools where you'll do a timeline of volume for a concert and there'll be big mountains and big valleys and big mountains and big and that's very organic and that makes sense but we all watch television and that's not how television works yeah. basically there's an expectation of now it's in a box and it's in front of me and I basically expect everything to come out of that box at about the same volume. And so when you're doing broadcasting, if you're doing webcasting, which is just broadcasting over the internet, there's not a there's some differences, but it's essentially the same concept. Now I'm expecting a much, much more limited dynamic range. I'm expecting, you know, if in fact, if we mix the same dynamic range for a broadcast, um, basically every time the band stops playing and somebody starts talking, everyone's going to be reaching for the remote control to add 15, you know, 15 clicks on their remote and then turn it back down and then turn it back up and turn it back down because, you know, we expect the volumes to be the same. We're listening to a band on, on whoever, whatever channel, since MTV hasn't done music in 20 years, whoever it is that does music now, you know, you're listening to a, to a band, on, you know, watching it on television, watching it on YouTube, yeah. and you switch to another channel and somebody's just talking. I expect this to all be the same. Yeah. Doing that live with a live event becomes very challenging because now I, I have to significantly decrease the dynamic range that I'm working in without making everything sound squashed and gross and bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's the big, like, overarching challenge in a nutshell. Since we mentioned churches, a lot of churches, you know, with when the pandemic hit, um, started streaming their services. And the probably biggest, most common mistake was essentially just taking their front of house mix and sticking it in a computer. And if they got the levels right so that the band sounded right, as soon as the pastor got up to talk or somebody got up to give announcements, they disappeared. Yeah. And people were like, I can't hear him talking. And then they would turn up their TV or turn up their computer to hear that. And then the band would come on and it would be distorted and loud. And that, that significant differential that you have to compensate for is, you know, one of the most basic things, but it's, it's a little unintuitive. You just kind of think, Oh, I just do this and I put it in a, computer and it will work. So that's fundamentally, that's one of the biggest differences is your dynamics have to be significantly more uh, compressed, both literally with com audio compressors and also just in a smaller window, but you still have to make it sound natural. And that's a very challenging thing. Um, 
beyond that, there's lots and lots of other, you know, per, percep, perception differences. Um, oh, and, and okay, so then the, the other, I would say, huge difference between mixing for mixing in a live environment versus a broadcast environment is if you mix in a live environment in a live concert environment you are mixing for one set of outputs your pa you know what it sounds like because you're standing right in front of it and you're making mix decisions based on this is what is coming out of these speakers this is what it sounds like and i'm deciding based on this as yeah. soon as you are in a broadcast environment regardless of the type of broadcast environment you're mixing for a thousand different kinds of speakers headphones airpods who knows what yeah and and you're having to make mix decisions based on things you can't even hear mm -hmm. so you're you're having to 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 create a mix that will translate and work a lot of this is from, comes from a studio environment too that will work on the broadest number of things rather than it will sound fantastic through this dmb rig that i have up right now and that's also a very different uh environment yeah well, that's cool I mean, yeah, it, it, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like the, 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 there's just so much perception in music. I, I, it's it's hard to kind of, it's hard to kind of get a, a sense of how stuff sounds unless you're listening to it on the right stuff. I don't know. Like, do, do, you have a, do you have a preferred uh, speaker that you use for like reference when you're doing broadcast stuff? I mean, is there like, like reference monitors? Do you use one of those like little RLX speakers? So the the answer to your question is um for most of the spoken word stuff that i do most of that stuff i use um i, I probably can't quite get it in the camera range but good old-fashioned fostex powered speakers which are a very very basic little four inch powered basic basic sounding speaker it's like it's very much like the little rlx little yeah. you know extremely basic doesn't sound particularly great um, it gives me a very average-ish kind of sound. Right. But, of course, when I'm mixing sp um, spoken word, when I'm mixing, uh, you know, conversations, um, I mostly just want it to sound like the people sound like when they're talking. I don't really right. want to change the sound that much. What I really want it to sound is just like them. So I'm mostly doing damage control. Does it sound buzzy? Does it sound really tinny? Does it sound... You know, really, does their the room they're in sound boomy? And I'll, you know, so I'm making from a tonality standpoint very, very basic adjustments. Um, do you do you lean heavily on effects? I basically, I, 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 I no. And in 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 point of fact, um, if if you're doing conversational stuff, you basically are never touching your effects rack for anything like reverbs or delays or any kind of the traditional what we think of as music effects however i use dynamic eqs very heavily i use compression very heavily um uh and um and i use auto mixing uh very heavily uh and so that's where those it's it's, it's basically do i use effects yes but just completely different kinds um <clears throat> you know because you know, dynamic EQs are, again, going to get me in that smaller dynamics window without completely hammering the way somebody's voice sounds. Um, it's a great way to get rid of proximity effect um, if somebody's using, say, an SM7 for their microphone and they lean into it and it gets really bassy and they lean farther away and it gets less bassy. And it's like, I don't want to just compress the whole thing. I just want to compress some of that low end so that when they lean in, it eliminates some of that proximity effect. Those kinds of things um, get leveraged, yeah, very heavily. And sometimes um, dynamic noise reduction. Uh, the the Yamahas all have the, the Neve 5045 plug-in, which is a, a an excellent, you know, di uh, noise reduction filter. Um, I use the Cedar DNS systems a lot, um, which is another kind of magic remove background noise uh, box. So, yeah, I guess I do use a lot of effects now that I think about it. I just don't. I just don't use reverb. I'm not. I'm not adding. I'm not adding room sounds typically to anything. 
Yeah, you know, those 5045s I've found to be invaluable tools uh, for any any band I'm mixing now. I always always have them. Um, they're they're fantastic just for yeah cleaning up those vocals, especially if, if you have a loud band behind you, a lot of drummers. Absolutely. It's one of those little magic tools. It's one of those little magic tools. And um, when uh, when it it was a Yamaha firmware update that put them on the, the CL and QL series, and it was one of the happiest days of my life. Okay. It was like, oh, now I've got a really great tool, and I've got a bunch of them. And yeah. so it's very common. Um, I, I'm, I'm working on a show next week, and I'm using every instance. I've already um, plotted out the, the input list and everything. I'm using every instance in a CL5 of 5045 I can get because yeah. it's, it's kind of like a magic cleanup. Because yeah. the other thing you have to remember is that much like a band, even if it's a panel or a spoken word or whatever, it becomes additive. So if you've got a lot of background noise, maybe for one person, it's not that much of a problem. But as soon as I've got three or four people or five people, like in, in the environment that I'm working in, I've got a lot of Omnilav mics in a big giant room with some HVAC noise. Um, it's not terrible. For just one person talking, it wouldn't even be that distracting. But as soon as I get five or six people on stage, all of that background noise starts to add up and becomes cumulative, and now, now it's a problem. Um, and yeah. those fifty forty fives do a, a, a huge work of of lowering that noise floor, and lowering the noise floor before I then go and compress all the dynamic range and bring it back up again. If that makes totally. sense. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> yeah, no, actually, a dynamic EQ I found to be inv invaluable uh, for music mixing. Again, on on vocals putting stuff out in the front of the mix uh, keeping some stuff from popping out i don't know it's just kind of like a little magic thing you know it cleans it's, it up, they're, they're, it they're, out. they're 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 kind of magic um 100 years ago um brooke sirens had the the 901 i think i'm getting that right which was uh, a an analog version of the same thing and once i discovered that i was just like okay now my rack i'm going to need 16 of these at yeah. all times because there's if, I, there's always going to be, a, I'm never going to want a regular compressor ever again because I want to be able to just, oh, I, some sibilance, get rid of that. Oh, totally. there's some honk, get rid of that. Totally. <coughs> I know, it's amazing uh, you know, to have all the access to the plugins these days and just you know be able to pop something exactly. in if you need it and not have to go just run back and be patching analog cables and, like, um, and hurrying and you know all that stuff. Uh, digital technology is amazing. 